UBA UAM mitigates IP theft by departing employees webcast. I'm your host, Nick Cavalancia from Tech Evangelism. We're going to wait about another minute or so before we get started, just to let any uh, late stragglers that are coming in, give them an opportunity to join us. So just sit tight for about a minute or so, and we're going to get started. Thanks a lot. Once again, welcome everybody. This is Nick Cavalancia, your host from Tech Evangelism. Uh, today's webinar is about how user behavior analytics and user activity monitoring help mitigate IP theft by departing employees. Uh, again, I'm your host. Uh, it's a very it's gonna be a great webcast today. I've got some really great speakers. Uh, up a little later on is gonna be Jack Doyle. He's senior sales engineer with Variato. He's gonna talk a little bit about their products. But before that, we've got Derek Smith. Um, Derek has got over 30 years in the security industry. He's a former government agent. Agent, cybersecurity um, subject matter expert, holds a variety of certifications including CISSP, CEH, CISO, Security Plus, etc. etc. The list kind of goes on and on. I used to call that the alphabet. He has the alphabet behind his name. Uh, he's got eight college degrees, a published author, conference speaker, cybersecurity analyst for several international and local television news stations. Uh, he's also a government program manager and more if that isn't enough. Uh, and you can follow him on at Derek A. Smith number one. So Derek A. Smith one on Twitter. And so with that, uh, Derek, I'm going to hand things over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Nick. And hello, everybody. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. And I just want to get started. Um, let me go to my first slide. Again, um, as he said, all those other things that he said about me. I'm also a college professor at a couple of colleges and universities. But more importantly, I spent 20 years as a federal agent. And one of the biggest pet peeves I had, one of the biggest things about being a federal agent that bothered me was that about 97% of my work was reactive versus being proactive. And that's kind of important because I see that same thing when I came over to cybersecurity. So basically, I spent most of my time chasing bad guys after an event had already occurred. As you know, most police officers or private detectives or detectives, they show up after a crime has already been um, permitted. Um, um, done. You know, we don't show up in time to prevent it most of the time. We're here to clean up the mess, hopefully to, to make someone pay for whatever that they've done. Now, <clears throat> ideally, that other 3% were doing things that's, that were going to prevent the crime in the first place. So I would travel around and I would do something called fraud indicators. I would teach people to look for fraud indicators. And those were the things that would show that their fellow employees, their coworkers, folks that they were doing business with would start to do different behaviors that might show that in the future they may do something that's against the law. You know, as far as fraud, they may want to have collusion with, you know, a vendor or a contractor to try to do price fixing so that, you know, the next person is going to get the contract because they're going to come in at the right price. You're going to have people who start to buy boats and houses and go on vacations and things that work with you and you wonder, well, wait a minute, this person was just telling me last week that they had all these different problems as far as, you know, money is concerned and now they're, they're living the dream. So what's that all about? So we had these indicators that allowed us to be proactive. So I entered the cybersecurity field and I saw the same type of thing. I'm like, okay, most of the time we're trying to keep people we have a zero-day attack, so we don't know what that attack is, or we have a signature that shows us how we're going to program an IDS or IPS or a firewall, you know, and that's going to be things that have already happened in the field, and we're hoping that we can prevent it from happening to our organization. But the thing is, again, we're being reactive to things that were already out there. So then I got into this insider threat thing, and I said, you know, most of the things that we see are coming from the inside, you know, we, we, we fight against the outside, we want to prevent those things, but a lot of stuff is happening inside, and I found that people weren't looking to the inside. So that's when I started thinking about this user behavior analytics and insider theft and looking for that type of thing. By the way, as an agent with the Department of Education, I kind of ran the inside the threat program. I don't, you know, don't know if you know this, but most um, 
frauds and things that occur with the Department of Education is from the inside. That's from a parent or a cousin or someone taking the identity of a, one of the babies in the family and using their their um, information to get to get student loans and all that because they don't have to worry about it until this baby is 18 years old and try to go to college and found out that somebody 18 years ago used their ID to get student aid. So that was the end. That's what, what was my real introduction to that insider threat. So let's go talk about that for a bit and let's see how we can guard against this inside threat thing and how we can put things in process that will help us to deal with this situation. You might say, Derek, why are we even talking about inside threat in the first place? Well, let's look at this situation. The, the typical outside hacker is going to include somebody who has skill sets or tool sets and backing from a range of nearly non-existent um, type things like um, the script kiddies. The so-called script kiddies are those who go out to the internet and they get tools. They don't really have sophistication and really know how to hack or write scripts or anything like that, but they pull tools down and they try to break into systems that they can get into and deface them, even steal money. But we're not really worried about them because most of the things they do, there's already something out there to prevent that. But then we have those that we call the hacking elite. And those are the so-called state-sponsored attackers who have great skills and they have the money and the backing and the time to actually go in and try to steal our intellectual property. Those are those ultra-elite attackers. And they fall into this 38% of the threats that come from the outside attackers. You know, the most of those folks are going to be those, those script kiddies, but some of them are going to be that ultra-elite that really want to break in. Now, interestingly, if you ask a group of security experts, and some of you are probably are security um, experts, 81% of those people are going to say that, hands down, insiders are the greatest security threat versus this 38% that comes from the outside. And as you see here, the remaining 62% of the threat comes from inside the organization. That's a large amount, because what are most organizations doing? They're looking to the outside. They're trying to stop that hacker from getting in in the first place when they don't know their own employees, be it um, on purpose or not on purpose, are causing most of the breaches that cost us a lot of money in our organization. So we have to look to the inside first. So it's always true that the outside attackers are going to be far more numerous than the insiders, of course, right? Because there's always going to be substantially fewer individuals out there working for the company. You know, even if you include all the employees, the contractors, the ex-employees, and things like that, they're going to be individuals um, who are going to be the outsiders, more of those trying to get in the door. But that's not what the big threat is. That's not where the big takeaways are. The insiders are the problem. And here's why they're the problem. Because they're going to be given that lo those log on credentials that we give them and access that we give them to confidential company information in order for them to go out and perform their job function. They don't have to compromise the security system like that outsider does. He has to start from scratch and try to figure out how to break in using his skills. All that insider has to do is log in and then they're inside our computer. So for example, if you have an employee who's in the payroll department and they regularly access employee names and addresses and social security numbers and you know income levels and all that to, to create paychecks, they fill out tax reports, they fulfill all these other job duties with your information, they're going to have sensitive information that they can, that if, if, if compromised can be detrimental to our organization. If we look at that data entry clerk in the sales department, they're going to re, um, regularly access your customer relationship management system, and they're going to update customer information and vendor records and all that. That data entry person and that payroll person are not generally considered high-level positions, right? That's not getting to the CEO or the CFO to get information. They're starting at that low level. But those positions are going to be granted daily access to the company's confidential data in order for them to perform their job duties. And if I'm going to be a sophisticated attacker, I'm going to target them because I'm thinking they're probably not sophisticated users. They don't know what kind of access they're going to give me once I get access to their credentials. So that's where I'm going to start. And then I'm going to look to do something, and that's escalate my privileges. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, again, um, I said insiders are the greatest risk that we have. We have what we call, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but we have something called credentialed um, imposters. And you see that in my criminal imposters, 2% there. Those are individuals who seek to sought and gain employment within our company for the main reason of infiltrating our, computers, our company's security and access and confidential information. Believe it or not, there are people who are actually paid to come to your organization, get a job, 
and get access to your information. You know, and I'm not talking about a Snowden type guy who just had to, happened to do it on his own. I'm talking about folks who are actually sent to as spies to infiltrate your organization. Now, those individuals are going to do what I just talked about a moment ago. They're going to seek out those low-level jobs so that they, they can hide in plain sight. You won't be looking at the receptionist or that data entry clerk as somebody who's probably stealing information and sending it to another organization. But while employed with you, they're going to seek out access to a lot of your digital assets, and they're going to try to get as many as possible, and they're going to try to covertly swindle, manipulate, steal, or by any other means acquire that, that information. And at the same time, they're going to work to acquire increasingly higher system access credentials so they can get access to even more information within your system. Now, also we have, that's the 2% from credentialed imposters. The second bullet, 14% of those come from insiders with criminal and malicious intent. They may not start that way, but as we know, some people, some employees are going to develop a bad attitude over time. It might be a bad um, supervisor. It might be just disgruntled with the work that they're doing, whatever it may be. Now, those individuals, though they might be a majority in the company, they're going to pose a significant threat to your organization because they intend to use their authorization that we've given them and the access that we've given them in order to get access to your assets for criminal and malicious reasons. They want to cause harm, harm to the organization, be it for revenge, be it because they're just upset with you, whatever it may be. So we have that problem. And then 40% are the result of insider negligence. But look at that number. 46% of the 62% are just people who don't have any type of nefarious intent, but their negligence or their lack of attention to cybersecurity is going to make them the weakest link in your security chain. So we have to try to figure out how to plug that weak link. Again, not malicious, just mistakes. And mistakes is going to cost your organization a lot of money. All right? So what I'm going to do now is that we have an intro of who are doing these type of things and what they're doing. I want to give you a couple of scenarios or a couple of case studies to try to bring this thing home for you. Okay? Again, insiders are your, your biggest risks. And... Um, let's, let's, let's consider George for a moment. George is a senior sales rep, right? And George understands the value of relationships in the organization. He's been around for a while. He started his current position about 10 years ago, let's say. Um, and over those 10 years, he brought, well, let's say this, before he even came in, he brought in his collection of hundreds of business cards and notes that he had already had from doing this type of work in the past. He's a sales professional. And what he did is he set to work entering that information into his employees customer relationship management system. So right now, George is a great employee. He's bringing in people. He has a network. He's using that network and all that. But over the years, George dutifully entered that information about his, his clients that would help him relate to them on a more personal level. So things like their birthdays, their kids' birthdays, what type of gift those clients want on holidays and all that. You know, it's about building a relationship. So other employees are also going in, and they're adding supporting details about that customer and other customer information. So still, George continues to be a great employee for our organization. You know, he's doing the things that he's supposed to do as a sales rep. But a little bit down the line, George is now preparing to start work for a new employer as their VP of sales, let's say. And to help him get off to a great start, and I'm sure many of us has done this type of thing in the past, but he wants to get off to a great start in that new company, he downloads his current employer's customer database. I'll tell you, I left organizations as an investigator. I have forms and you know old cases that I've done, and I've used those as a template when I move on to a new organization. I take those with me. So George is doing the same thing. His rationale is that much of that current data was from his hard work anyway. Remember all those cards that he brought into the organization? That was his personal contribution from his former collection of those business cards. George thinks it's okay. But take a look at what I have over in the right sl slide there. Removing or copying the company customer list is bad uh, for the organization. Even if a company was to shut down the doors today, if they have a customer list of people who have bought from them before, that is the gold for that organization. You can close my doors, you can take away all my equipment, all my products, but if I have that customer list, I can be up and running again rather quickly. So if I have here, as I have here, customer lists are legally protected under federal and state laws as a trade secret. That's a type of intellectual property. And our intellectual property is what makes us a viable organization. So once the customer record is part of the company's database, and I mean those, those records that 
George brought in in the first place and entered into the system, once they're part of that company's database, it becomes the exclusive property of the company. So removing customer records may constitute a criminal activity by Dave. This is something that he has to think about. Now, according to the FBI, intellectual property includes your ideas, your inventions, your creative ex expressions, your trademarks, you know, your, your patented items, your artwork, movies, you name it. All these things are your other intangible assets that you create um, to, for the viability of your company. And that can be created by individual working for you or by the company itself. Now, the law provides that companies have an exclusive right, again, to the use and possession of that, that, of that intangible asset that they produce. And that includes, again, that customer and those vendor lists that George was doing. Okay? Just the same as they have the same rights or exclusive rights to the use and possession of those tangible assets, like the building that you're working in or a manufacturing company that you happen to be working in. So George, thinking that he can walk off with customer records just because he helped create those records, would be the same as me being a carpenter and building a house and thinking, I built this house, I put the roof in, I can live in it, right? I can't do that, you know. Or if I'm an assembly line worker and I'm building your car for you, I think I have the right to build, to drive that car or borrow your car anytime I want because, hey, I made it, right? We just can't do those type of things. Let's take a look at a different situation. Let's look at Sally this time, right? Equal opportunity here. Um, so Sally is a dedicated application developer. And she spent a lot of time last year writing code for a set of highly interchangeable software modules, let's say, as part of her company's larger project that they're doing to expand, you know, their microservices platform or something to, for, for folks. So she coded her modules in a way that they could be utilized across a broad array of applications within the company. Now, she looked at those modules as tools in her mechanics toolbox. These are things that she used to do her job on a daily basis. So right now, Sally's a great team player. She's sharing, she put them out there so other people can use those modules, and that's great. Now, since developing those modules consumed a lot of her work time and even required her to work from home sometimes, she freely kept a copy of that source code on her personal laptop. I mean, at my job now, I work from home, and I have a laptop where I have a lot of stuff that, from my government agencies that, um, that I use from home. But right now, Sally's a hard worker, right? She works overtime and she works from home. She's a valued employee in the organization. But now Sally is planning on starting her own IT company, doing consulting based on that work that she did coding those modules. Now, she reasons that those modules are her baby, right? I made this, this is my baby. And nobody else really understands the code in any way um, or the effort that I put into creating that code, so it's okay. So again, I want you to take a look at the right and what I have here. It says, retaining work submitted to the employer after employment ceases. Most companies require new employees to sign an agreement stating that all work, creations, patents, all those other intangible items created by the employee belongs to who? It belongs to the company. If the company is paying you to do something, if you're doing it on company assets and company time, then it belongs to the company, folks. And retaining what belongs to the company after leaving is the same as keeping the company's laptop. She may as well have kept the laptop. She's done something that she couldn't do. Before we walk away from the case studies, I want to give you a real case that happened not too long ago. On April 12, 2017, a software engineer was arrested for trying to steal proprietary information from his, from his employer. So this engineer worked for his company for more than a dozen years. And for the last five of those years, he helped his employer develop and update a securities tra trading platform, which was pretty nice. And when he learned that his immediate supervisor was leaving the company, he started to develop and execute a plan where he can take out or remove that original source code past his company security for his own use. So what he did was this. If you've heard of steganography, I'll tell you what that is in just a second. He, his plan involves steganography. And that's the practice of hiding messages in other documents like PDFs and, and pictures and photos and things like that. So what he did was he sections of that source code was hidden within documents that on first glance it appeared that they were they were innocuous. They were they weren't any problem. And not only that, they belonged to him. They were like his personal documents in, that related to his immigration, his taxes, his images that he owned. And since that personal property was his, the plan was to have the company return those documents to him after he decided to leave. Now, if he had been successful, he wasn't, but if he had been successful, the former employee could simply just walk out the front door 
with those items that he got back that belonged to him. And what else was he going to have? He's going to have that hidden source code in that in those documents, and he's going to walk away with it, and he's stolen from the company. Once again, that's something that you can't do. Let's look at how much this costs the organization. Again, inside IP theft is a bigger problem than you all might think. He's like, ah, it's just a few things walking out the door. Remember, I told you it's the bulk of the things walking out the door. So your insider intellectual property theft is going to most likely be carried out by, um, as I said before, by 2% of the criminal imp imposters and the 14% of the insiders who are your employees, your contractor, your ex-employees and all that who develop that criminal and malicious intent. But then there's going to be data that's pilfered, uh, like financial data, your confidential consumer information, your price list, your marketing plans, your sales data, competitive intelligence. I mean, think about this. Kentucky Fried Chicken isn't Kentucky Fried Chicken without the chicken recipe, right? And that one that's on the Internet probably is not the right one. But with that, without that, that's their competitive intelligence. That's their trade secret that they have. And also the theft of that IP that I'm talking about can be devastating to your company. So depending on the nature of it, like the chicken recipe and the amount of the IP involved, your company can lose its competitive position or it can even be in danger of not existing anymore because that's what gave you the competitive edge. That's what made your company in the first place, and now it's taken away from you. But what happens is this. If you're looking at my slide here, a lot of the employees feel like they are entitled to the company's intellectual property because they either help design it or you know they personally contributed to it, or whatever their reason may be. They think, okay, Derek, um, you know, I, I did this, I helped do this, so I can take it with me. But that's simply not the case, as we all know. But looking at my side, 87% of the people attempt to take their work results. As I told you, my, I myself, before I understood this, would take things out that I said would, could be used in another job. It wasn't to be malicious or anything like that. It was just good things that I had built, and I said I can use it again. 28% of the department employees is going to attempt to take information that did not that they did not help to create. Okay, they didn't have act, they didn't have the rights to use it, but the problem is they had access to it. You know, they may have even used it in their job function, and they're going to walk away with it. Either way, there's a problem here, as you can see that. All right, another interesting fact is that 74% of all data breaches that we have in an organization originate from inside a threat. Okay? The employees, the contractors, those ex-employees I talked about who are given access to the IT system and those digital assets are taking things out, folks. They're walking away with this stuff. Okay? And based on company surveys that's been done and self-reporting by a lot of different organizations, the average company has a 92% likelihood of experience a breach in the next 12 months. That's everybody that's on this call right now. 92% of you are going to have a breach. So it's not um, if it's going to happen, it's really, again, when is it going to happen? And then what am I going to do about it? So what does this tell you about your, your cybersecurity and what you're doing at this time? It tells you that maybe we should be fo focusing most of our cybersecurity efforts, resources, time, and money on looking at the inside threat. It does not help me when I put a firewall up, an IDS, an IPS, and I'm trying to stop traffic from getting in, but once they get in, I'm not observing what's going outside of my organization. I mean, what are they taking out of the organization? That's what's going to be important. I mean, just think about um, Snowden. I put Snowden in the book, but think about Snowden. Snowden was already inside working as a sysadmin, and he was copying one. He copied 1.7 million records, but nobody was looking at the activity of what's being copied inside and noticing that. You know, they they're just noticing that. I mean, they don't even notice Snowden because he's already inside the system. And that's kind of the problem that we have. Now, quantifying this even more, a breach is usually going to cost your organization about $7 million. And I have that broken down in my, um, on my pie chart there, how this works and where it comes from. But 8% of it is notification. I know that some of you have gotten um, mail from Target or whomever saying that, hey, your information has been compromised. You know, and also they have to pay for things like credit monitoring and all that. But just sending out those letters and contacting you, that's a cost there. And 8% of that is going to come from there. 10% of the cost is for detection and escalation. That's bringing in your forensics people or you know, other professionals that you have in order to try to solve this problem that you now have. 
you know, and also even trying to have to buy more things, more technology, more stuff to try to detect it in the first place instead of stopping it at the front door before it even happens. So this is one of the things that we have um, that we have here. Okay, and 25% of the cost is for your response afterwards, dealing with other things that's going to happen, like that 57% you see below the lost business. A quick story I have for you. Um, I worked at Booz Allen for a number of years. And one of the things at Booz Allen is that we got hit by Anonymous a couple of times while I was there. And think about it. I'm Booz Allen. And my job is to ensure that most people, other folks, are protected cybersecurity-wise. So what do you think is going to happen when I have to go out and tell all my customers that we've been hit ourselves and we're supposed to be securing you? Do you think that we're possibly going to lose some of those customers? I'm going to lose some business? Oh, I got a lot of explaining to do anyway. And also there's going to be those ex post response things that I have to do. So we have to consider that as part of our response and as part of the work that we have to do. Now look at how this breaks down even further. So $4.7 million, you know, 4.765, 11, companies have an annual breach risk from their insiders that can be quantified at this level. Okay? And at least 16% of that risk, or $762,000, come from malicious insiders and those criminal imposters. But remember, that was that small percentage, that 2% and that 14% comes from the criminal imposters and the malicious insiders. But that other amount of that $4 million comes from you know, the de-escalation and the detection and the loss of business and ex post responses and those type of things. A lot of money just goes into fixing that problem after it's been broken. So another area that we have to look at and figure out what is it that we can do to try to make this better within our organization. Now let's talk a little bit about how people steal intellectual property from us in the first place. And you know, there's a lot of different things that you can look at and a lot of different ways that they do this. But for these purposes, I'll give you a few that I talk about and that I write about um, that they can use. So the main thing is this. With technology, technology. When I said when the I when the internet came around, I said, you know what, this is one of the best inventions ever, but it's also one of the worst inventions ever. Also, so we look at technology. Technology is kind of a double-edged sword for us. So on the one hand, it's going to allow us to generate tremendous economic gain and growth and all that that we never could have had before, and be it through data mining or advanced analytic capabilities or whatever it is that comes from us being a highly interconnected ecosystem that collects sellers and, 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 um, and buyers ideals, ideas and things like that and able to, to reach our customers, PayPal that didn't exist, Amazon.com, all these things that wouldn't even exist without technology. However, that same technology makes it possible for employees to quickly make off with whatever data um, that those authentication credentials and that access we gave them allows them to do. So it's the best of both worlds, it's the worst of work, both worlds. Let's look at what they do. So thousands of customers are able to go in with, um, let's say, a thumb drive like you see on the picture and download anything they want. Again, when you look at Snowden, he took thumb drives in and took 1.7 million records out. That would fill a room properly. When I was in law enforcement, we used to have to do discovery, and they bring boxes of stuff in, and could fill a floor or two full of boxes. Now I can take all that stuff and put it in the thumb drive you see on the picture. So that's one of the ways that they're able to easily get this information out, and it's hard for us to detect it. We don't see that in a person's pocket. Another thing out there is smartphones, the smartphone technology we have now. That's re readily um, connectable to your company wireless network. You know, it has an enormous storage capacity. You know, this is a whole computer that guy's hand um, holding in his hand now. And think about the many gigabytes of data that he can put into this thing, or even not even put it in, but transfer it using his phone to a system that's working for him, a secondary device that he can go back and look at later on. How about email? Email, messenger services, IMing, OCS, those type of things that's out there, they provide a convenient way for employees to send a lot of uh, information out, you know, confidential documents and all that to their personal home computer or somewhere else they want to use to, um, to retrieve it later on. So another way people get things out, and again, this is just a few. 
And what are people doing mostly these days? I do it two days a week. Some of you are probably doing it right now, but working from home. So working remotely is going to allow employees to access the company system from their personal computer. And again, download information that we don't even know are coming out of the organization. So how do I stop those type of things? My job as a cybersecurity professor, professor, uh, professional, and your job, even if you're not in cybersecurity but you're a company owner, a business owner, you want to stop this type of behavior. So what are some of the things that we can do in order to try to stop that behavior? I'm going to give you just a few hints, and we'll talk about some more as we go on later on. But the first thing I want to do, the most important thing to me, is the, this thing called least privilege. And if you don't know what least privilege is, what it does is it restricts users to the minimum functionality and data access they need in order to perform their daily duties. So let's look at Snowden once again. I keep picking on him, but let's look at Snowden. Snowden... Had, as a system administrator, he had rights to see anything in the NSA computer. That was too much power for that one guy. He had no reason to be able to see 1.7 million files that he had access to. If I have a receptionist or I have a data entry clerk, oh, let's say a finance per a person working in the financial department, the CFO is going to see all kind of financial information for the company, but that clerk, the low-level clerk in the financial department, don't need to see everything. So we need to limit what that person have access to and what they can perform duties on. And that includes the digital, the physical, the intellectual access, all that, right? The next thing we have is configuring firewalls to block, block outbound data transfer websites. So when we have technically minded employees, they can use file transfer websites to go out and quickly move large blocks of data out of company, uh, out of company control. Let's say Dropbox, for instance. It's easy for me to set up a Dropbox account take some personal files and move it up to my Dropbox account and they're out of your system. I mean, they're not out of your system, but I've copied them into my system. Right? So you want to look at configuring your, your firewall to deny any outbound data flow that's going to, and that's going to prevent most of your employees from utilizing those type of sites like Dropbox in the first place. At my job, I cannot even get access to Dropbox from the internal network. So we can't even use those type of processes. We can't do those type of things consider doing that same type of thing in your organization. Another thing is encrypt all data at, at, at all stages of storage, require user authentication to utilize that data. So what that does is two things. But let me take a step back. Usually your employees have access to your digital assets, which is not required for their job duties, again, like Snowden. But creating, um, you need to create credential levels for those types of things that you have out there. That data encryption is going to fill that security gap that we have between the credential levels that we have, the top secret, the secret stuff we have, and what that ac employee actually need to do their job. But here's what it really does. First of all, it's encrypted and they can't read it in the first place. And even if they can read it, if you look at the last one, my bullet, it requires user authentication to utilize that data. So now I'm going to know who had access to the data, when they had access to the data, and hopefully I get to see what it is that they're doing with that data as well. So encrypt all the data. So even if it is captured, even if they do have access to it, if they don't have the right to know, the need to know, and the right privileges, they won't be able to read it anyway. Next is keep detailed record of employee interaction with the company's digital assets. So a lot of jobs require some access to your IT system and your digital assets. We already established that. So we keep that detailed record of how the employees utilize their access and handle those company digital assets, it's going to help us to quickly identify honest mistakes versus some type of nefarious activity. Sometimes some folks, that malicious activity I talked about earlier, folks want to do bad on purpose. I can kind of distinguish that because I'm keeping good audits. I'm keeping good records. And here's the secret to that. I know a lot of organizations that, that have audits. They keep a lot of records. Here's a secret. You got to go back and read that stuff, folks, and you got to know what to look for. You got to see what it is that people are actually doing and then take some, some type of action on that. So that's going to be um, critical to your detailed records and keeping those. Next is increase your monitoring of employees once HR is informed an employee may be leaving. So the time to start increasing your monitoring is even before the employee be becomes aware that his or her time with the company is ending. And monitoring them should establish baseline behavior from which anomalous activities can be quickly detected. One more quick story. Again, I'm picking on Booz Allen again, but when I worked there, at one time, we, we laid off 1,000 employees. And employees like myself, cybersecurity folks who are low-level jobs, 
we were pretty much asked to leave. I, I didn't. I wasn't asked to leave, but they were asked to leave um, right away. So as soon as you get your notice, you're out of there. Now, my partner that I work for, a million dollar owner, um, an earner, he had 30 days before he had to leave. So think about this. Who's going to be more likely to steal some information or divert information? It's me, who I can go out and get a job probably in the cyber field within a week, or this guy who has to replace a $1 million income? Might he be transferring customer lists? Might he be transferring um, customer contacts so that he can either start his own business or be a valuable asset at the next company he comes into when he brings all these customers? That person should definitely be monitored, and his privileges should definitely be lessened to something where he can't transfer information out. And another important thing is, is to conduct, conduct exit interviews. So the exit interview is more than just me saying goodbye, have a good life, and things like that. It's a time to notify the employee that all the company uh, property they has, the laptops, you know, um, whatever else they use in your company, needs to be returned. And it's also a good time for you to evaluate, to evaluate whether or not that employee has returned all the tangible and intangible company property. You know, if he had access to software, if he had access to other IP, intellectual property, make sure you get that stuff back. Don't just say, X interview, how was your stay, um, how was your, your boss, or whatever. Get the valuable information that you need to find. So these are some of my general recommendations. There's many more you can do, but you can start with this in, in order to build your program. Now, here's the thing. We're going to talk about user behavior now, okay, and what we can observe. I told you as an agent, we were taught to look for user behavior, okay, analyzing that behavior. So psychologists and employee managers have long known that a person's behavior can provide some subtle insights into that person's state of mind. You know, you work with a person every day, you start to see their differences. You start to see they're drinking more or spending more or they're missing time at work or whatever it may be, right? So humans can intuitively process those little changes that they see and get a sense of when that trusted employee, that buddy of theirs, is becoming a rogue insider or might be a rogue insider in the future. But, of course, it's going to be impractical for us, if not all the way impossible for us, to or an organization or your HR staff to observe and monitor every single employee in an organization for those telltale signs that we're looking for that's going to indic indicate that there's a probability of IP theft. So there are things that we can do around that. And as I stated, um, well, I'll say this. User behavior analytics is one of those things. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to bring my partner Jack in. I'm going to let him pick up from here. And he's going to tell you a little bit more about user behavior analytics and how he can help you with this type of thing. So, Jack, are you there? I am, Derek. All right, buddy. Can you hear me, Derek? You. Yes, sir. It's all you, buddy. I appreciate it. Thanks for the intro. Hey, everyone. I'm Jack. I'm a senior sales engineer at Variato, and I appreciate your time today. I'll try not to take too much of it up, uh, but I'd like to talk with you a little bit about how Variato's solutions can help you solve some of the problems that Derek has talked about earlier in the presentation. We're going to start with our product called Variato Recon. Variato Recon actually learns the behavior patterns of individuals and peer groups to establish a baseline of that user's normal levels of activities. Then changes in the user's behavior are detected in real time uh, as meaningful variations from that established baseline. So anomaly patterns indicative of insider threats will then trigger alerts, and Variata Recon utilizes advanced machine learning algorithms and detailed statistical analysis to discover those potential insider compromises. Traditional defensive security technologies like Derek was talking about earlier, firewalls, uh, in, uh, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, and things like that, cannot efficiently detect uh, insider threats. User behavior analytics or user and entity behavior analytics systems are compromised of machine learning algorithms that allow computers to monitor each user and then analyze his or her behavior against an established normal baseline. There are many ways a technically proficient insider can get data out of company control. Variato Recon watches and learns the patterns and characteristics of insider use of each of those methods from moving data to cloud storage solutions like Dropbox or Microsoft's OneDrive, uh, Google Drive, for example, to tried and true methods like email uh, that Derek was discussing earlier, and even low-tech means such as printing. 
So if, uh, if a user is printing an unusual number of documents, uh, things like that, uh, Varyata Recon will notice an alert on that activity. All UBA systems are user behavior analytics systems, analyze user behavior and compare it to those established baselines. However, what if the user's behavior remains within the system's defined tolerances for normal? That is, what if an exiting or a departing employee continues to perform his or her job function normally? Is there any other means by which IP theft may be predicted and prevented? Varyato Recon triggers alerts when anomalies are detected on either technical or psycholinguistic indicators, providing a unique and powerful source of information about potential problems. Alert frequency and delivery methods are configurable within the software uh, based on your own preferences. One of the things that sets Varyato Recon apart from other offerings is its ability to flag psycholinguistic anomalies, basically changes in the way an insider uses language patterns that are proven warning signs of attack or other behavior, which may be harmful to the company. These range from shifts in tone and intensity to changes in word choice uh, and changes in the use of different pronouns and things like that that linguistic experts and studies have shown to be indicative of heightened risk behaviors. A best practice to mitigate IP theft by departing employees is to keep detailed records of employee interaction with the company's digital assets. Clearly, and of course it would be impractical, as Derek was saying, for a human supervisor to watch over the shoulder of each and every employee. Automated user behavior monitoring, such as Varyato Recon or Varyato 360, however, can keep a detailed record of the user's interactions with the company's digital assets. Varyato captures information about every application and every window opened by a user every day, including when and how long employees are actively using productivity applications, which productivity applications the user prefers, uh, someone gaining access to applications and files who should not, and so much more than just that. A best practice, as Derek was mentioning earlier, is uh, to mitigate IP theft by departing employees uh, would be, for example, to increase monitoring of employees once HR has been informed that an employee may be leaving or you've received an alert of that employee's unusual or anomalous behavior. Ideally, increased monitoring begins before an employee is notified that he or she will be leaving, but that's not always logistically possible if the employee leaves voluntarily. User activity thus needs to be monitored at all times, and this is especially true, uh, as Derek was saying, for remote employees. With Varyato's document tracking features enabled, you're able to track specific activities on USB drives, uh, network storage, and even cloud storage drives. You can see when new files are created and when existing files are edited, renamed, or deleted. And you can also, of course, track print operations as well. Variato's screen capture functionality records everything on a monitored computer screen. You define how frequently you wish to capture a screenshot from the default of every 30 seconds to as frequently as every second if you want to do that. In addition to regularly defined intervals, triggers can be used to initiate screen capture. For example, an additional screen capture can be taken when the user opens a new application or they visit a website or if they right click the mouse, for example. Armed with Variato uh, 360 and Variato Recon, organizations are able to proactively respond to potential IP theft from departing employees and protect themselves uh, from the harm that would otherwise occur. I appreciate your time. For more information about Variato and our products, please visit variato.com. Uh, I believe there are some questions uh, that have been submitted. Uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Nick at this time uh, to go through those questions, and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank so you Nick, very much. Nick, this is, Derek. Hi, Nick. Good this is Derek again. So I wanted to know if I can take a moment to just talk a little bit more about user behavior analytics and how it provides some early warnings. Do I have another right two ahead. minutes? I can? All right. Uh, go right ahead. you got plenty of time. All right, great. So as I said before, you know, I was a federal agent, and we looked for those early warning signs. I would travel the country, and I, I would talk about those fraud indicators that I told you about earlier. So as I said, I discovered this user behavior analytics. I'm like, this is right on time for being proactive. And basically using sophisticated algorithms and statistical analysis that's way beyond my eight college degrees, UBA systems were able to predict insider attacks. You remember that movie Minority Report? And there's another television program to come on. I can't remember the name of that. But they're able to see that this person is going to do something, and they can preempt that before that person does it. 
So we're looking at this um, from, especially from so-called emotional attackers that may, we might run across. So what we do is this: by paying attention to the words that's used, the sentence structure that they develop, even what's not said by individuals, which is just great. We use something called psycholinguistics, and we use that to gain some dynamic insight into the inner working of that individual's private thought life. You know, so we, what is this person thinking? What is he going to do in the future? Now, just to give you a little history about that, that field, the former field of study around that was developed in the late 50s and the late 60s. So this is not new. Psycholinguistics has been around for a while. But what it does is it analyzes that user's language over time to get that baseline. You know, it looks at the, um, and then that algorithm goes out and it measures that user's change in their emotion, their attitude, their personality, their behavior. And then me and you, those folks like us, the IT security professionals, we gain a quantifiable preemptive, as I said before, a heads up that that employee or that user may be at risk for becoming an insider threat. And that's what we want, right? Again, proactivity. So going back to those psycholinguistics, the psycholinguistic software that we use is going to provide us a scientific real-time tracking of that user's written communications through that computer system that we're using. And then we're going to get a dynamic profile that's going to be updated on every one of those users that's in that system. So it's not just a static thing. It's going to be dynamic again. And we're going to see over time what that baseline is and how that baseline is going to change. And what it's going to do is that software is going to compare that live profile that we have to that individual's baseline and the current communications that we see and those of that user's peers. And, and, and don't worry, when you talk about privacy and all that, it's not like we're big brother and we're watching your every move. But the software is going to be sophisticated enough to differentiate between what we see and what we expect as behavior, what that person might be termed as um, occasional employee sarcasm, or if there's really a pattern that we're looking for that's going to signify a significant and genuine threat is developing and we have to do something about it. We have to react on, on that threat. So today, when we look at linguistic security algorithms, um, it does, it's not going to take corrective action against what those suspected threats are. But what it's going to do is, is this. It's going to alert us. It's going to tell us that maybe HR, maybe cybersecurity, maybe security, you should pay a little bit more attention to this particular employee. Okay? Now, psycholinguistics is just one aspect of how the um, user behavior analytics and UEBA works. All right, or this class name in general, but it's going to give us another tool that we put in our toolbox box that's going to look for anomalous behavior of those credential users, those insiders that we have within our organization. Okay, so using these tools that Jack talked about, we're going to be able to analyze suspicious behavior. Um, we're going to be able to look for who might become a problem before they become a problem. All those things we talk about, we talked about a little while earlier. All right. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give a, an introduction to how this psycholinguistics and this user behavior work in the first place if some of you haven't heard about it or not very familiar with it. So with that, Nick, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, and um, you can ask, ask some of those questions that I know are being answered. But one last thing, one last thing. The real power behind this UBA is that it gives us real-time detection of threat activity. So let's look at it this way. Somebody... Um, does get into your system using compromised credentials. Suppose they know exactly what they're looking for, exactly what they want to require. They know exactly where it is. In less than a minute, they're able to um, get to your sensitive information, and they can transfer that stuff out of your system. So how long is it going to take for them to download a couple thousand customer names and your customer list and credit cards and all that? So that person is going to be faster than any type of human response that we can put up against them. But using that UBA and they're monitoring that in those individual users and that individual behavior, we be, will be able to mount uh, a, a good defense to stop those people in their tracks. And I'm sorry, Nick. I talk a lot. With that, I'll turn it over to you. You sure? <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> hey, man, with, with eight degrees, you got a lot to say, brother. It's I'm, all right. I'm passionate about this. I can tell. I can tell. Actually, we've got a ton of questions on here uh, that have come in, and we've got about 11 minutes or so left in the, the web uh, webinar. So um, 
I do want to ask one that has been answered online, but I think it'd be good for the audience to hear this a little bit. And it said these webinars always target large organizations. Of course, that's a bit subjective, but enterprise organizations. It says, what about small businesses, like uh, owners under, like, let's say, one to 30 people are, you know, they're at risk too. You know, these people need to be covered as well, don't they? That's That came from um, Beatrice. So she's wondering, hey, how about the little guy? The little guy needs to be worried about this as well? I'll say you, what I'd like what I yeah what I'd like to say is it, if you have some kind of intellectual property in your within your organization that if that intellectual property were taken could harm your organization then absolutely you need to be protected. And I think almost every organization can answer a yes to that question regardless of their size. Perfect. Derek, did you want to add something because I think you might have been on mute. I'm sorry, I was. So I'm sorry. So even with a smaller organization, I think you're even more at risk because loss of your intellectual property can be even more detrimental to your organization. You don't, you don't have, you're not a booze island with millions, and you can lose some, and you can keep going with billions. It's gonna, be, you're gonna lose prop, you're gonna lose something, and it's gonna be, it might shut your doors, it might shut you down. So you need this kind of technology even more so than anyone else, and it's gonna be easier for them to learn the habits. You know, UBA to learn the habits of the few employees that you have. So I think it's 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 critical that you have a, a, a something like this in your organization. All right. So um, I've got a question here. Uh, this might go more to you, Jack. Uh, Abraham is wondering: Does Very Auto Recon provide prediction of insider threats months or years ahead of a breach? That that's very difficult to answer. I'm not sure that uh, that that I could say definitively that, that it would be that far ahead of a breach. But we do watch different uh, indicators. We look at users' behavior patterns with relation to email messages they're sending. We look at psycholinguistics also, the number of attachments they're sending, things like that, files they're transferring to locations outside the organization or to USB drives, um, things like that. But um, I don't know that I could say that necessarily that uh, we could predict uh, insider activity that far in advance. I don't even know that the user is even, you know, aware that they're doing anything that far in advance. So I, I don't think I could, I can give a good answer there. Unfortunately. Derek, any thoughts there around maybe the cycle yes. indicators and what they might be pr prom uh, promoting uh, you and what kind of time frame in advance? Yes. So Abraham, here's one thing you got to consider. Something can happen tomorrow. Let's say that uh, an employee has a kid sick in the hospital and they need to get money right away for an operation or a transplant or something. So the thing is, be behavior can change rather quickly. And so we're looking for that, be that change, but you're talking years down the road. Usually when something like that is going to happen, it's going to be something that happened, a significant emotional event in that person's life that's going to make him have to make some type of decision or he's about to leave the organization or the company. So it's more so going to look at those type of things. Now, you could, of course, watch a person over the years and you start to see subtle changes. They become more disgruntled. They start talking more about how they hate this company and how they want to do this and do that. And you probably could build a profile. But remember, this stuff happens rather quickly. That's my answer for that. Good one here. Jack, I think this is a good one for you. Um, Elman wants to know which sources of information do you support for UBA and UAM? You've named some, but maybe you can go through that in a little more detail. Sure. I talked about email. We'll look at uh, some we, – we capture all the records associated with email activity. So if you do need to go back and review the actual contents of messages and things like that, you certainly can do that. But as far as building the baselines and looking at what's normal for users, we look at the number of emails, we look at the number of blind carbon copies, we look at the number of attachments, uh, we look at uh, the language patterns, the psycholinguistic indicators as we talked about. We also utilize those psycholinguistic, psycholinguistic indicators to gauge a user's sentiment toward the company. So um, if a user is kind of negative, that's okay. If they're generally positive, that's okay. But we look for a change in the user's sentiment. So you might find out, for example, from HR that this employee may be going to work, they're leaving and they may be going to work for a competitor. And you see that they uh, sent an unusual number of email attachments uh, over the last couple of days and their sentiment is generally more negative than it was before. So you can use those uh, indicators to determine whether or not you want to review the activities. Uh, we look at document tracking activities. Um, locations on the network that are unusual for those activities to take place. Um, we look at files transferred to removable storage or cloud storage solutions. Um, we also look at uh, users who are using 
applications they don't typically use uh, or the time they spend using those applications has changed from what's normal for them. And we recently added uh, compromised credentials. So we can look at uh, VPN server log uh, for Microsoft's routing remote access server right now. I think we're going to add some other VPN uh, technologies later, but right now we, use, we utilize uh, Microsoft VPN. And we can look at um, users who don't normally connect to VPN connecting uh, or connecting from an unusual location. A good example is uh, I got a colleague of mine, Steve. I was um, staying with him a couple of, we uh, couple of weekends ago. And we both uh, sometimes work remotely, so it's acceptable for both of us to connect to the VPN. There's nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to do that. But I normally connect to the VPN from my house. Steve normally connects to the VPN from his house. So when I was visiting Steve that weekend, if I connect to the VPN from his house, that would be considered anomalous behavior, where Steve connects to the VPN from his house, it's not. So we use uh, some technologies to determine where those connections are coming from and look for users who are connecting from unusual locations or at unusual times. I connect typically during the day, but if I connect at 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, that would be considered anomalous. But if I work in the middle of the night, then that wouldn't necessarily be considered anomalous. So those are some of the different things that, uh, that we look at uh, with our U, uh, UBA solution. Perfect. There's another good question here from Alvin. He's wondering, is this cloud-based software monitored, or sorry, is cloud-based software monitored by Variato, or is this just local monitoring by IT? So is it cloud-based? Is it on-premises? wants to know. Uh, our document tracking technologies that look at files that are created, edited, deleted, renamed, and printed, uh, we do have support for the locally synced folders for Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, and Dropbox currently. And the, but the, the, the Variata 360 and Variata Recon products themselves, are they cloud-based or are they local and done by, so basically they're asking is the monitoring oh, no. done by okay. Variato or is the monitoring being done by IT? The monitoring is being done by IT. They are on-prem solutions, both of them. So we do not uh, host any of your data in the cloud, nor are we able to, uh, to ever see any, any of the uh, activities that you're monitoring. Perfect. Um, there's another uh, question here from Simon. Is the employee made aware that they're being monitored? That's a great question, and Derek might want to talk a little bit about some of this too, but as far as Variato 360 and Variato Recon go, uh, whether or not the employee is going to be made aware that they're being monitored would be completely up to you. So, uh, so you can uh, determine um, policies within your organization and procedures and whether or not you want employees to be aware that their activities are being monitored. Our product would support both, uh, both ways. So it's really up to you whether or not you want them to know they're being monitored or not and uh, how you want them to become aware of that, whether you want them to become aware of it through the software simply displaying an icon on their screen that tells them they're being monitored or whether you, if you don't want to do that and you just want to tell them through a policy, um, that, that's completely up to you. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to add there, Derek? Um, not, not at all, Jack. I, I echo what you said. I think it should be part of your own um, organizational policy. I think there's something to be said for both for both ways. Um, I, I've seen a shift lately um, where more and more companies are making their employees aware that their activities are being monitored because they don't necessarily want to have to react to something. They, if a if a if an employee is uh, reminded that they're being monitored, they know they're being monitored. Maybe they're less likely to do something they're not supposed to do, and therefore you never have to react to the problem. Uh, if the if it doesn't occur, whereas if an employee doesn't know they're being monitored, you know you, you'll know that the activity took place and you can respond to it. Uh, you may be even able to predict it using the uh, user behavior analytics. But um, it's best. Some companies feel like the uh, the best effort is made when the users are aware they're being monitored. So, Jack, I'm going to ask the obvious questions. What about my privacy rights? Sure. So with Variato, we, when we developed Variato Recon, uh, we did that with privacy in mind. Um, with Variato Recon, the data is collected. All the activities on the client computer uh, that's being monitored are collected, but they're stored on that client computer and they're locked away. And we hold that data for 30 days. And then we send metadata back to the uh, server so that it can be processed and, and against the uh, algorithms and uh, can be determined whether or not any of that activity is 
uh, anomalous, but it's just metadata. So we'll look at uh, some psycholinguistic indicator scoring. We'll look at the number of email attachments that are sent, number of emails sent, things like that, but doesn't necessarily include uh, what the, the contents of those were. And then if a, a company determines that an investigation into that user's activities are justified, then they can unlock that data and they can go back and see what that employee has been doing for the last 30 days and they can see what that employee is doing on an ongoing basis for as long as they uh, feel that they need to uh, investigate that activities. I sort of think of it sometimes like a black box. The data is being recorded, but until the plane crashes or you think there's a problem with the plane, you never really look at it. So uh, we use uh, those technologies to protect the user's privacy too. Perfect. Looks like we're at the uh, top of the hour. I know that we didn't get to all of the questions. So for those of you that we didn't, who didn't get their questions answered, um, someone from Variata will reach out to you via email and make sure that you do get your question answered. Likely it's going to be Jack, just saying. You never know, Jack. And uh, and with that, I just want to thank both Derek and Jack. You guys did a great job presenting. I think there was a lot of information here, especially in the, the con uh, comments here in the Q&A. There's a lot of uh, you know thanks and comments for how good the presentation was. So that's usually a good leading indicator that everyone else enjoyed themselves. So thank you to you both. And for you guys in the audience that participated, provided questions, and just simply uh, stayed along with us till the very end here, we appreciate your time today. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. We'll catch you in the next webcast. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.